process, which started with the massacre of Mongol envoys and merchants in Otra, resulted in the destruction of the Khwarezm Shah state and the capture of most of its territory by the Mongols. Despite the inclusion of Khwarezm lands into the Mongol borders, some problems couldn't be solved. The most important of these was the failure to capture Khwarezm Shah Muhammad, who had fled to Iran. In order to solve this problem, Subutai and Jebenoyans was sent after him with a cavalry force of 25,000 men. Although the expedition was organized for the capture of Muhammad of Khwarezm, it turned into a reconnaissance operation in itself, as the Mongol commanders both captured the cities they encountered and continued their activities after the death of Muhammad of Khwarezm. The Mongols advanced into Iraq, and after capturing and destroying Ray, the city of painted tiles, they destroyed the city of Qom, the home of the Sheets. As the city of Hamadan surrendered, they were content with taxing them, while they punished the people of Kazwin, who resisted them by massacring them. Tabriz, on the other hand, escaped the occupation thanks to its gold and was subjected to tribute. When winter came, Jebe and Subutai organized an expedition to Georgia, passing through the Mugam Plain. At that time, Georgia was ruled by Georgi Lasha III and Parlak, and this Christian kingdom was at the peak of its power. However, they couldn't stand against the Mongol commander Subutai. In the battle near Tbilisi, the Georgian army was destroyed by the Mongols. At that time, the Mongol commanders Jebe and Subutai prepared to march on Baghdad to destroy the Abbasid Caliphate. Such a possibility would have been terrible for the Islamic world. Because at that time, the Crusaders had come to Egypt with the 5th Crusade and captured Dimyat. It wasn't possible to defend Iraq with the small Abbasid army gathered in Dakuka. That year, it would have been possible to see the Mongols in Baghdad and the Crusaders in Cairo. When Subutai moved on Baghdad, he wanted to pass through Hamadan and take tribute again. The Hamadanids refused this offer and resisted against the Mongols. Thereupon, the Mongols attacked the city, slaughtered the people and set the city on fire. When the news was received that the Knights of Georgia had reunited against the Mongols, the Baghdad expedition was cancelled and he set out to Georgia. The Georgian knights were the most excellent of their time. Subutai, who made a false retreat after the short battle, drew the Georgian knights to the ambush where Jebe was waiting. Thus, the most powerful army of the Georgians was destroyed in this way. Since Subutai and Jebe's goal was to reconnoitre, they didn't capture the cities, but only break Georgia's power. From here, they moved to Shirvan and sacked Shamak and Derbent. Thus, they left no other important power in the region other than the Anatolian Zeljaks and the Ayyubid Empire. The Mongols expanded the expedition and advanced to the Alan lands in the north of the Caucasus. According to Reshidettin, the Alans asked for help from their neighbors, the Kipchaks, upon the dangerous situation that arose. When the Kipchaks responded positively to this call for help, the Mongols suddenly found large armies of Alan, Abazin, Kirkashin and Kipchak tribes against them. In the short battle, neither side could defeat the other, and the Mongols retreated. Subutai then sent an envoy to the Kipchaks to break up the enemy alliance and defeat them in pieces. The Mongol envoy addressed the Kipchak commanders as follows. 
we are of the same race with you. But the people of Elan are not from you. Therefore, you shouldn't help them. You are not even of the same religion. We pledge and promise that we will never attack you if you obey us. If you do not come between us and them, we will give you as much goods, money and clothes as you need. The Kipjaks, who trusted the word of the Mongol envoy, made a treaty with them and returned to their homeland with the money they received from the Mongols. With the withdrawal of the crowded Kipjak army, the Alans were left alone against the Mongols. Finally, they were defeated by them. The Kipjaks, who had made a non-aggression pact with the Mongols on condition that they would leave the Alans, believed that the Mongols would keep their word. Therefore, they disbanded their armies and scattered in different parts of their homeland. However, the Mongol commanders didn't intend to stop their campaign. After a while, they attacked the southern borders of Kumania. Upon this situation, the Kipchaks prepared to fight with the Mongols under the leadership of Yuri Konchakovich. The Kipchak army, resisting the Mongols, suffered a heavy defeat against them. According to Russian sources, even Yuri Konchakovich lost his life in this battle. Thus, the Mongols plundered all Kipchak goods, including the gifts they had previously presented to the Kipchaks. They not only looted, but also slaughtered all the Kipchak people they came across. Finding the pastures of the defeated Kipchak suitable for wintering, the Mongols suspended their campaigns and spent the winter in the steppes of Kumania. With the arrival of spring, the Mongol campaign resumed. Their first target was the rich cities in Crimea, especially the city of Sukdak, with which the principalities were in close contact. The city was attacked by the Mongols, captured and looted in a short time. After that, Mongol commanders attacked other Crimean cities, villages and towns and increased their wealth. Meanwhile, a Kipchak army under Kotyan, one of the Kipchak bays, advanced towards the Dnieper and reached a place called Kipchak Wall. Upon reaching this place, which was considered to be the border between the Russian principalities and the Kipchak countries, envoys were sent to the Kiev nobles. With plenty of gold, livestock and beautiful girls, Kotyan aim was to make an alliance with the Kiev nobles and fight against the Mongols in this way. According to the chronicles, Kotyan's envoy asked for help against the Mongols by saying, Our lands were captured today, and yours will be captured tomorrow. Help us. If you do not help us, we will die today, and you will die tomorrow. In fact, the Mongols hadn't yet attacked the Kiev principle. However, the destruction of the Kipchaks, who had an important power, worried the Russian nobles. Kiev Prince Mstislav sent envoys to various Russian nobles and asked for a meeting to be organized in Kiev. In this embassy delegation, Mstislav told the Russian knights, If we do not help the Kipchaks, they will definitely surrender to the Mongols. Then, the power of the Mongols will increase even more. He pointed out that if the Kipchaks were not helped, they would face a bigger problem. Upon this request of Mstislav, the other Russian princes, who were already worried, accepted his proposal. Only Yuri II, Prince of Vladimir, declined the offer, as he was preoccupied with Novgorod affairs. Meanwhile, the other Russian knights had gathered armies against the Mongols and united on the right bank of the Dnieper in April. The assembled Russian army was quite large. In the chronicles of Ipatevsky and Sokisvi, the crowdedness of the army was emphasized with the statement that the water wasn't visible due to the large number of soldiers in the Dnieper Gorge. According to modern historians, the number of this allied army, combined with the Kipchak army, reached around 80,000.
The Mongol commander Subutai had 20,000 horsemen under his command, consisting of Mongols and Turks. This gathered Russian Kipchagami was four times bigger than themselves. Subutai, who closely followed what was going on, sent an embassy delegation of 10 people to the Russian headquarters in Sarup in order to weaken the strength of the enemy army by breaking the Russian Kipchaga lines, as they had broken the Alan Kipchaga lines a year earlier. The Mongol envoys were received by the Russian princes. The Mongol envoys started his speech. We have heard that you are marching against us because of the deception of the Kipchaks. But we have neither captured your lands, nor your towns, nor your villages, nor are we coming against you, but we are marching on the vile Kipchaks, who are our slaves and horse herders sent by God. If you make peace with us, there will be no enmity between us and you. If the Kipchaks flee from you, expel them and take their riches for yourselves. We have heard that they have done many evils to you in the past, and that is also the reason why we are at war with them. He tried to separate them from the Kipchaks and even provoked them. The response of the Russian princes to this message of the Mongol envoy was to kill the entire Mongol embassy delegation and send their corpse to the Mongols. The Russian princes, not realizing how great an offense this was in the eyes of the Mongols, mobilized their armies. Sobotai sent a second Mongol embassy delegation after their delegation was killed. However, this time, the delegation didn't come with a peaceful message like the previous one, but with a letter containing harsh expressions. In this letter, Sobotai said to the Russians, you listened to the Kipchaks and killed our envoys. You marched on us even though we didn't attack you. Come, may God judge everything. Despite the killing of the first delegation, the Russians were extremely impressed by the arrival of a second delegation and the expressions they used. And unlike the first one, this time they sent the envoys back safely. Now, the campaign had officially begun. Upon the mobilization of their enemies, the Mongols decided to follow their movements more closely and sent vanguard troops. These Mongol troops were spotted by the Russians in the direction of Dnieper. Mstislav III, the Prince of Kiev, attacked the Mongol vanguard with a thousand troops under his command and defeated them. Meanwhile, Gemyabek, who was leading the Mongol vanguard, was killed. After this first contact, the Allied army continued to advance with even more courage. Meanwhile, Subutai was retreating with his army towards Donetsk, trying to fight the right place to meet the incoming Russian army. In order to draw the Russian Kipchak army to him, he again sent a small Mongolian vanguard to the Allied army. The Russians also noticed this incoming column and started to pursue them. The Mongol vanguard abandoned the animals and retreated, almost telling the enemy where to move. Sobotai's aim here was to reduce the number of his rivals by weakening their connections with each other and to draw them to the region he wanted, which was the Kalka River. This tactic worked. The Kipchaks pursued the enemy at the front with their fast Turkish horses, while some other Russian knights tried to catch up with them. At the rear, the forces of Kiev and Chernigov were trying to catch up in a disorganized manner. Since the Russians had never met the Mongol armies, they said among themselves that they were simple people like the Kipchaks. So they followed the Mongols' tracks without even sending a vanguard force. The Mongol army under the command of Subutai and Jebe were lying in ambush at the Kalka river and waited for the Russian Kipchak army to arrive. Following their enemies, the Allied army approached the Kalka river on the 31st of May after an 8 day pursuit. In this area, a part of the Mongol army was waiting for the Allied armies in a forest area on the opposite bank of the river while the other part was lying in ambush at a point in the direction of the river flow. Behind them was a reserve force.
Arriving on the banks of the Kalka River, the Allied army approached the river. The commander-in-chief of the army, Mstislav of Galicia, ordered the armies to cross the river. Kiev and Chernigov forces were about to reach the river. At this moment, Subotai saw that half of the Russian Kipchak army had crossed the river and the other half was just coming across the river. Thus, the Allied army was split in two by the Kalka river. Taking this opportunity, Subotai ordered his army to attack. The Mongol soldiers came out of their hiding places quickly and attacked their wet and unprepared opponents. Seeing that the Mongols suddenly came out of hiding, Mr. Slavich ordered them to take up arms immediately. In the first attack, the Kipchaks under the command of Yarun were easily repulsed by the Mongols. Immediately afterwards, they attacked the Russian column, which included Romanovich, Semen and Vasilko. Fierce and bloody battles took place here. Romanovich and Vasilko were wounded in the ribs with a pike. The Allied forces who were surprised were mowed down by the Mongol forces and suffered heavy casualties. Meanwhile, the Kiev and Chernigov forces on the west bank of the river started to cross the river to come to the aid of those on the east bank. Since the merger of the two armies would pose a danger to the Mongols, Sobote ordered his army to retreat. Russian sources interpreted this withdrawal as the Mongols fleeing, but this wasn't an escape. Mr. Slavich, thinking that the Mongols had fled, ordered his army to pursue the Mongols. Thus, the distance between them and the Kiev forces, which had already widened, increased even more. Seeing that the Mongols were being chased by those on the eastern bank, the Kievan forces slowed down their advance, believing that they had won a victory. Meanwhile, when the Mongol reserve forces attacked the Allied army, pursuing the enemies, Subutai, who was retreating, attacked again. Thus, the Allied army on the eastern flank was completely surrounded by the Mongols. In the face of this new and unexpected attack of the Mongol army, confusion arose in the Allied army. The Kipchaks were the first to flee. The escape of the Kipchaks caused the general confusion in the army. Seeing that some other forces of the princes also began to flee, the commander-in-chief, Mr. Slavich, also left the battlefield. The Kievan armies, who had been complacent because they thought they had just won a victory, became worried when they saw their allies on the eastern side beginning to flee. The Kievans had lost the psychological advantage. While one part of the Mongol army chased the fleeing troops, the other part attacked the Kievan armies. Seeing the Mongol heavy cavalry from Kargik coming towards them rapidly, the Kievan knight Mr. Slavich III ordered his troops to attack. The Mongol horsemen rushed into the Kiev ranks with great speed and began to mow down the Kiev horsemen. The most fierce moments of the battle took place here. On the one hand, the whistles of Mongolian surge and arrows were making the battlefield groan. On the other hand, bags full of gunpowder, called neft, were being thrown between Kiev ranks by Mongolian soldiers, creating a grenade effect. Kievans had never seen or heard of such a battle before. In a short time, the Kiev ranks began to scatter and flee. They slaughtered the Kiev knight Mstislav III and his men by crushing them under wooden planks. Thus, on the third day of the war, the last Russian resistance on the battlefield was destroyed. While this was happening at the Kalka River, the main part of the Mongol army continued to pursue the Russians and Kipchaks, who had fled the battle. This pursuit continued until the Dnieper River. The Mongols killed or captured those they could catch. Some Russian soldiers drowned in a stampede, 
while crossing the Dnieper River. The losses of the Russians, who had already suffered many casualties in the battle, increased even more. Most of the Russian princes who participated in the battle were missing. Their bodies were neither found nor heard from again. Mongols plundered all villages and towns until Kiev. They didn't touch the city of Kiev. Ukrainian steppes became almost deserted. There was no resistance or movement left. Thus, the activities of the Mongols in the region came to an end. Preparing for their return, the Mongols marched forward to join Genghis Khan, who was returning from the Khwarezm campaign at the time. Thus, with this expedition, the Mongols realized that there was no power in these regions that could challenge them. From its beginning to its end, this war developed in a rather surprising way for the Russians. It was a natural consequence of this that the Russians didn't even have the opportunity to properly understand the identity of the Mongols. The following statement from the First Novgorod Chronicle are enough to summarize this situation. This year, because of our sins, an unknown community came and no one knew for certain who they were, where they came from, what their language, race or religion was. But they called themselves Tatars, other Turkmen, and still others said that they came from the Etrian deserts between the east and the north. According to Mephody, they will emerge from Gedon at the end of the world and will conquer all the land from the east to Ephraim. Only God knows who they are and where they come from. Those who understand the book certainly know who they are, but we do not know who they are.